Four races in the books coming off of the COVID-19 layoff and one more coming up, which will be the fifth race in, I believe, 15 days for the NASCAR Cup Series. It's been fun. It's been crazy. There has been way too much rain, but we get to watch a race in Bristol on Sunday, and there is no better way to cap off this really fun run. And it's going to be interesting for DFS, too, because it is radically different from what we had for Wednesday or, I guess, Thursday's race. So it's going to require by our recalibration of our minds and what we're seeking out from a roster construction perspective. So let's go through what we should be doing for the Supermarket Heroes 4 or 500. Welcome on into the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst here to break down the Supermarket Heroes 500 at Bristol. Once again, the fifth NASCAR Cup Series race in 15 days. There is no race this upcoming Wednesday, which is kind of heartbreaking to think about, but there will be another one the following Sunday, and I believe the Wednesday after that. So still a lot of racing coming up, even if the the crazy, crazy stretch is coming to an end with this Sunday's race. And it's a really good way to go out, because if you have not watched a race at Bristol before, you're in for a treat. It is basically like putting you know, 40 cars in a blender and seeing what happens. That's effectively what Bristol is. It's called the the Last Great Coliseum. It's a a huge, high-banked, fast, short track. And those sound weird together, but it leads to a lot of fun racing. So I'd recommend watching the race, even if you decide maybe you don't want to play DFS for it because it is going to be an entertaining afternoon of racing. Lock is at 3.30 p.m. on Sunday. 3.30 3.30 p.m. Eastern, I should say. Once again, no qualifying and no practice for this race. And we'll go through the implications of that in just a bit. But more good stuff coming up next week here on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. As mentioned, we'll have another podcast for NASCAR for the following race after Bristol, but also a UFC pay-per-view event coming up next week. So make sure you check us out for that. If you're listening to this before Saturday, you can also check out the UFC podcast we did with Austin Swaim for the May 30th card. Uh, Check out Austin's thoughts on that here in this exact same feed. And make sure you are subscribed to get all these podcasts right as they go live. Before we take a look at the track breakdown, ever wonder what would happen if the Chicago Bears had drafted Patrick Mahomes or if Michael Vick played against Lamar Jackson? Well, now you get to find out. With FanDuel's Football Multiverse, a new contest type consisting of Madden simulations around crazy what-if scenarios. Each scenario will be streamed on YouTube and have an accompanying free-to-play fantasy game. This week in the multiverse, what if the Jaguars had drafted Deshaun Watson instead of Leonard Fournette in 2017? Test your prediction skills and play a free DFS tournament for $3,000 in real prizes where Watson and the fournette Jags square off with the Indianapolis Colts. Head to FanDuel.com slash NFL Multiverse to enter. And do not forget to subscribe and tune into FanDuel's YouTube channel on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern to watch me and JJ Zacharyson call that game. Should be a whole lot of fun to see Deshaun Watson on the Jacksonville Jaguars. Let's dive into the track breakdown here for Bristol. And the name of the game this weekend is Laps Led. Because there are 500 laps in this race, which means there are 50 points available for Laps Led on FanDuel. And we're going to get multiple huge upside plays within this specific race. Now, when we're looking back at past history at Bristol, it's important to note that they are running a different package than they ran last year. Last year, the Cup Series had high spoilers on the cars at tracks like these, and it made passing really tough. And that does change the dynamic of the track. They're going back to a lower spoiler package for this year, similar to what they had in 2017 and 2018. Before that, they didn't have stages, and that does change things from a lap slide and a domination perspective. So if we're trying to get our most representative sample of what to expect at Bristol, we're going to focus on the four races in 2017 and 2018 at Bristol to decide how we should play things this weekend. In that four-race span, 10 drivers led at least 100 laps in a race. That is an average of 2.5 drivers per race. There were 15 drivers who led at least 60 laps, and three drivers led at least 200 laps, which is 20 points on FanDuel from that category alone. So clearly, we need to put a huge emphasis on that when building lineups. If you stack the back here like we did for Thursday's race, your lineups are going to suck, and you are not going to cash. The one tough thing to juggle here is the starting order. 
in those races, the drivers who started first had major speed in qualifying, or else they would not have won the pole. And we saw that speed prior to the race. Three of the four pole sitters had had led at least 100 laps in the race, and that was important, and it made sense, because they are fast in qualifying, probably going to be fast in the race too. This year, the pole setter will get that spot via a draw. They will set the, the field the same way they did before the first Darlington race. The top 12 cars and owner points will occupy the top 12 spots in the race, but the order of those 12 spots will be set by a draw. Then the, the, the same thing for the cars, 13th or 24th in the owner points, and so on and so forth. This means the driver starting on the pole may not have the fastest car on the track for that day. Instead, the driver with the fastest car could be starting in Theory 12th. That makes things tougher for DFS because we have less information to go off of. But we should give a major bump to the drivers who draw high starting spots. Of the 10 drivers to lead at least 100 laps in that sample, seven of them started within the front three rows, so first through sixth. Passing may not be super tough, or at least as tough as it was last year, but track position will still matter on this track, and laps tick off in a hurry. If you get the lead, you're probably going to lead like 40 or so laps just because of how fast laps go by on this track. So you should account for where drivers start when making decisions. I do not think that means you need to write off a stud if he starts 12th, though. The other three drivers who led at least 100 laps, who started outside the top six, started 10th, 16th, and 18th. Kyle Busch won and led more than 150 laps from the 18th starting spot once. So as long as the cars are fast, they can still do it. It's just harder to do. Let's say your favorite driver for the race draws a 12th starting spot. It's a pretty big bummer. I would still be okay using them, though. I would just use the wave strategy when doing so. There, you would use someone starting higher in the order who can lead laps early on. In case you didn't know what the wave strategy was, didn't hear our, our Coca-Cola 600 podcast, it's where you use drivers and waves. A wave one driver who can lead laps early on, and a wave two driver who can lead laps a little bit later. There, you can scoop up the points for laps led both early and late and still use the guy starting back in 12th spot. So, Laps led are a major emphasis, and that's an easy thing to say. It's easy to, to, to look at you and say, we want drivers who will lead laps. Well, duh. The problem is that it's super expensive. Drivers who lead laps generally aren't super cheap. Thankfully, there are a pair of ways to work around this issue. The first is that not every driver who lead laps will drain your salary cap. In the 2018 fall race, the night race, three drivers led 100 laps, and they were all $11,000 or cheaper on FanDuel. One of them was below $10,000. In last year's fall race, Matty Benedetto led 93 laps. That was most in the entire race, and he was in really bad equipment. If you see a mid-range driver starting near the front who can lead laps, awesome. Lock that driver in. That might let you get three lap leaders onto your roster, which would be huge from an upside perspective. You're getting, if you're getting access to 40 points for laps led versus 30 or 20, that's going to make a big difference. So those mid-range drivers are a key to getting additional lap leaders on your roster. The other key to working around the salary cap is punting, which is very much in play here. Punting works for two reasons at Bristol. Uh, the first is that equipment matters less, so the pool of drivers who can get a good finish is larger because fewer drivers are crossed off due to bad equipment. Second, there are going to be crashes, especially with the smaller spoilers back in the car. In our four-way sample from 2017 to 2018, 26.9% of the drivers who started the races finished at least 20 laps down. Every time one driver crashes, every driver behind them moves up a spot, which is worth 1.5 FanDuel points when you account for the finishing points and for the place differential. So instead of finishing 25th, someone might finish 18th just because of attrition in front of them, and that can work at the right salary. So to me, I think this gives us a pretty clear way to view drivers in each salary tier for this race. For the studs, we need them to be able to lead laps. If there is a stud who you don't think can lead laps, that's a pretty major opportunity cost. And we don't want to take that on in, at a race where laps led are such a major focus. And most of the lap leaders are going to come from somewhere near the front of the order. So that's why our studs probably should start pretty high and need to have the upside to lead a lot of the laps. For the mid-range plays, they're kind of swing guys. 
If they're up front and can lead laps, awesome. That is super attractive. But if they're starting a little bit further back, they can also work as long as you already have two lap leaders locked into your lineup. If you don't have those two lap leaders, it's a much tougher sell to use mid-range drivers who are starting deeper back. There, you might want to find the salary to jump up to someone a little bit more expensive who can lead laps and settle for a cheaper mid-range play beyond that. Then, for the value plays, the default hope is that they are starting further back so they can get place differential. The place differential is a lot easier to get at tracks where there are wrecks, which there will be at Bristol. And you can make up ground at this track. You can make passes. You can finish better than you start for sure. So, I would shoot for place differential. There are some teams with good drivers who are outside the top 24 in owner points and could start outside the top 30 even. So, if we find cheap plays like that... They're going to be really hard to pass up. So shoot for place differential on the cheap guys, uh, unless you think they have the upside to lead laps. All right, so recap here. Strategies for Bristol. Laps led, laps led, laps led. I think that if you're feeling out a lineup and you don't have two dominators in that lineup, two guys who could jump out front and lead a lot of laps, you should reevaluate because that's the minimum, I would say. And if you can get three, that is even better. And three is generally a, a place that you get by using mid-range drivers who are starting near the front. You can use the waves strategy if necessary. If you like a driver starting in, in, you know, 10th or 12th or something like that, you can use them. I would just pair them with someone starting closer to the front who can lead laps early on. Look for cheap drivers who can lead laps. We'll go through a couple of them in our tier-by-tier breakdown, and I'll pinpoint drivers who I think have the upside to do that. Uh, So I will note them. We'll try to find those players so you can get additional laps led upside in your roster. And finally, be willing to punt because punting is more viable here. Those drivers can finish better than they do at most tracks, and we want access to extra upside, and those really cheap drivers get us exactly that. So that's the strategy for Bristol. Let's take a look at some specific drivers who fit what we want by going tier by tier on FanDuel, starting off with Kyle Busch at $14,000 through Denny Hamlin at $12,000. Kyle Busch is, if you look at just Bristol, he's the clear top driver. We just haven't seen the same speed from him this year. If we look at all eight races so far in 2020, Kyle Busch's led just 14 laps. And he also kind of weirdly, and this is strange to say, and I'm acknowledging that it's weird to say, but he struggled at the end of last year too, even though he won the championship. Yeah, he won Homestead, but leading into that race, there were questions about the speed for Kyle Busch. So if Busch were to start all the way at the front of the pack, I would trust him as someone who could lead laps because this is a different package than they've had at the other races. Maybe he's just had issues uh, with that package, but... When they were at Phoenix, uh, the other race they've had with the low spoilers, he ran really well. Sixth place average running position, third place finish there. I think that that, that gives me a bit more confidence, but uh, I think that it's hard for me to be to view Kyle Busch as a must-use play, even if he starts up front, just because the speed this year has been a bit questionable. So if Busch draws a high number, I will go there because I think that he is worth that. But if he draws a lower number, like if he draws 12, I'm okay being lower than consensus on Kyle Busch, despite the elite history that he has at this track. Interestingly enough, uh, running my model this morning after adding in last night's race, the top guy in my model is Brad Keselowski. He is $12,300, and I'm pretty okay with being high on him. And I think that the reason that I, I sound surprised is because my model doesn't usually like Keselowski that much because he doesn't dominate races all that often. And that really gives a boost to drivers in the eyes of my model because we want lap sled. We want guys who are running up front and winning races. Keselowski doesn't do that. He does run well at Bristol, though, even if the finishes don't back that up. He had a top six average running position and led at least 40 laps in both races here last year. The form is obviously good for Keselowski, too, because he won the first Charlotte race, finished seventh last night, Sixth place average running position at Phoenix using the same package. And I think that that's enough to get me to buy in. As with everybody else starting up front, my interest in Keselowski will depend on where he draws. But I do think it is worth noting that I'm higher on Keselowski than I usually am entering a race. The Penske cars last year were just elite at this track. So I want to buy into them. It is a different package. And I I acknowledge that. But using this new package this year, 
It was Joey Logano who won, and uh, we didn't get to see what, what Ryan Blaney could do, but Penske won that race. So I'm still in on them despite the change in package. Overall, I'm high on Penske. Brad Keselowski is included in that. This is a good track for Chase Elliott, too. He is in this tier. He has had a top five average running position in two of the past three Bristol races. Kevin Harvick benefits from this being a track in the old package where his driving style is better accentuated, where he drives super deep into corners. That's better at a track like this where there's more off-throttle time than when he's at a, a faster track. So it's a tough tier to rank uh, for sure, but if I had to rank them based on how interested I would be if they were to all draw at the front, uh, somehow <laughs> they can't obviously, but if they were to do that, I'd go Keselowski first once you consider his salary. Elliott would be second. Then Harvick third, Kyle Busch fourth, Denny Hamlin fifth, and Martin Truex Jr. sixth. I just generally think we should be high on Brad Keselowski at $12,300. Let's move now to the second tier on FanDuel. That is Joey Logano at $11,700 through Jimmy Johnson at $10,000. And in this tier, it's worth noting that Johnson will be starting between 13th and 24th. And that's going to make it hard for him to lead laps. And he's kind of in the range where I'd prefer him to be a lap leader over a place differential guy. So I'm not inclined to be super into Johnson right now unless he draws like 24th and there are two clear lap leaders I like elsewhere, then maybe I can get there. But Johnson is going to be lower in this tier to me just because his ability to dominate and lead laps is going to be lower than everybody else in this range. The others in this range are all starting in the top 12 spots. And Two of those drivers are Penske drivers. And as mentioned, I love Penske for this race, and they're going to lead this tier for me. Those two guys uh, driving for Penske in this range are Joey Logano at 11.7 and Ryan Blaney at 10.3. And both those drivers have awesome histories at Bristol. Logano has led at least 95 laps in two of the past three Bristol races. And that means he has done this in both the lower spoiler package and the higher spoiler package, which bodes well for Sunday when they go back to the lower spoiler. Logano has had a top eight average running position in six of the past 11 Bristol races, and that includes three top five marks. And that's a race winning strength number. If you have a top five average running position, you are a contender to win that race. As for Ryan Blaney, the stats don't always show up, but this is arguably his best track. Blaney has led 100 or more laps in three of the past four Bristol races. In one of those, he wrecked while leading, so not a good finish there, but he has had a top eight average running position in five straight Bristol races, two top five marks in that span as well, and Blaney actually leads all drivers in the field in the current form only part of my model, and I think that's super interesting because he was good both in the old package and this one. I think that Blaney is a great bet to win. Uh, odds were not up at FanDuel Sportsbook as of this recording, but Blaney's also cheap for DFS at $10,300. I was talking in the track breakdown about trying to find mid-range drivers who can lead laps and win. Ryan Blaney is the guy I was thinking of when I was talking about. $10,300, upside to win, a lot of laps led in his past this track. So Logano and Blaney are going to sit atop my rankings in this tier before the qualifying draw. But Ryan Blaney specifically, a really intriguing name to monitor for Sunday's race. Kurt Busch is here too. He is 10 6. Uh, there are lots of similarities between Kurt Busch and Ryan Blaney, where they could be cheap sources of laps led. So I'm going to rank this tier Ryan Blaney 1, Joey Logano 2, Kurt Busch 3, Alex Bowman 4, and Jimmy Johnson 5. The Hendrick cars, a little bit lower on my list. Uh, I've loved the speed so far this year, and I'm not off them, but I've seen other teams do really well at this track type before, so I'm going to gravitate towards them over the hot Hendrick cars. The middle tier on FanDuel is Eric Jones at $9,600 and uh, Eric Alma, or through Eric Almarola and Matt Kenseth at $8,000. The two guys in this tier who will draw within the top 12 spots are Almarola and Matt DiBenedetto. DiBenedetto almost won this race last year, as I mentioned before. He led 93 laps, fifth place average running position in that race, and that was while he was in bad equipment. Now, he is in the same equipment as Blaney, Keselowski, and Logano. He drives for Wood Brothers Racing, but the way that team is described is that they are a Penske team with a separate Twitter account. So, he's basically a Penske teammate. So, if Di Benedetto were to draw really well within those top 12 spots, you can bet I would give him a lot of thought, even though it is risky to use a cheaper play starting at the front because you have less safety up there. But Di Benedetto has the upside to win, and if not, he could still get a really good finish. So 
I've been wrong on DiBenedetto at times this year. I, I've whiffed a couple of times, but he's also paid off a couple of times. He could still get at least a really good finish. Um, I like DiBenedetto a lot, and I could definitely see myself going here, especially for tournaments. Probably not for cash games, but for tournaments, sign me up for DiBenedetto. The other guys in this tier who I think have a, a shot to win are Eric Jones and Clint Boyer. Jones is $9,600. Boyer is 9000 And both those drivers are going to start between 13th and 24th. The reason that I'm not as off of them as I was off of Jimmy Johnson is that they're all cheaper. So opportunity cost is lower. Boyer is $1,000 cheaper. Jones, $400 cheaper. And Jones has been really good at this track. He led 260 laps and finished second here in 2017. He was also top five in 2018. And both those races in 2017 and 2018 were in rules packages similar to what we'll have this weekend. Boyer has four straight top eight finishes and three straight top 10 average running positions at this race. He even led 120 laps in one of those. So this is a really good tier. I think that if Di Benedetto draws high, if he draws well enough to lead laps, I think I would rank him first in this tier. Otherwise, if he's in the back half of the top 12, I still like him, but I'd probably favor Jones and Boyer uh, going with Jones over Boyer just because I think that the the safety in them would be intriguing there for sure. I, so I think that that's the way I'm viewing these two. I think that Di Benedetto, Jones, Boyer, all of the upside to win. William Byron and Matt Kenseth are in play. Just a little bit lower on my list entering the weekend. The value plays here are Ryan Newman at $7,700 through Ricky Stenhouse Jr. at $6,200. And here we find some really cheap plays, and they're all starting between 13th and 24th. My favorite driver in this tier is Tyler Reddick, and this is the first cup race at Bristol for Reddick. But he did win here in the Xfinity Series last year, and he was second in the other race last year in the Xfinity Series. Reddick has also proven how well he can handle himself in the Cup Series of late. He has uh, a top 14 average running position in five of the past six races, and one of those races was at Phoenix using the lower spoilers they will have this weekend. Redick is $7,300. That means we do not need him to lead laps in order to pay off. So he is a driver I will likely use regardless of where he draws between 13th and 24th. You could use a similar line of thinking and talk yourself into John Hunter Nemechek, who is $6,400. Nemechek did not win at Bristol in the Xfinity Series, but in nine races there between Xfinity and Trucks, he has five top five finishes, and he has also been outrunning his equipment in the Cup Series of late. He had really impressive runs in both Darlington and Charlotte coming off of the layoff. And that was those were at tracks where equipment matters more than it does at Bristol. There is risk here because Nemechek will start in the top 24 and his equipment is not on par with a lot of drivers up there. But I think he's a legitimate threat for a top 10 finish. So two of the rookies in this tier, Tyler Reddick and John Hunter Nemechek, are going to be really solid value plays. We would want them to draw toward the back of this range if we could get them, but hey, if they draw 13th, I'm still going to consider them because they are that good and that worthy of our respect and admiration with how they've run so far this year. Chris Buescher, Austin Dillon, Ryan Newman, they have all had good runs at this track in the past. Buescher had an 11th place average running position in the spring race last year in worse equipment. Newman was ninth uh, from an average running position in that race. So all of them would be options if they were to draw 20th to 24th. I just wanted to highlight that Redick and Nemechek specifically are really easy to love for this race. The punting tier on FanDuel is Christopher Bell at $6,000 on down, and everyone in this tier is starting 25th or lower. So we can rank them straight up and see who has the best place differential upside. My two favorites personally are Bubba Wallace and Christopher Bell. And Bubba's equipment is terrible because he's had brake issues two of the past three races. He had brake issues at Pocono a couple years ago. And that's concerning because it is something we cannot control. It is something he cannot control. And we don't want to have a lack of control when playing DFS. But Bubba is a good driver, and that shows up at Bristol. He has had a top 17 average running position in two of his four Cup Series races here. He even led a couple of green flag laps in one of them. The equipment breaking is a risk here still, but I'm willing to take that risk thanks to the finishing potential that Bubba does have. So it's a risk because the, the, the car is bad, but the driver is good, and I want to buy into drivers at this track. For Christopher Bell, the equipment is less of a concern. It's definitely not great, but it was in this car that Di Benedetto finished second last year. 
Bell was also awesome in Charlotte with back-to-back top 15 average running positions. So the equipment came through there, and Bell dominated on concrete in the Xfinity Series. He won two races at Dover. He won one at Bristol, another runner-up spot at Bristol to boot. So he's 6000 Bubba is $5,000. They are my favorite drivers down here by a pretty wide margin. If you want extra access to lap led, laps led, lean on those two guys. Get yourself extra flexibility because I think the finishing potential here is good. We want as many laps led as possible in each of our rosters. I would also mention that Ryan Priest is a good option at $5,000. Ty Dillon could get the job done. So you've got punting options, and I'm very, very willing to go down here regularly to get more access to lap sled. So Bell, Bubba, my top two options, Priest and Ty Dillon, other guys I would turn to at $6,000 or lower in order to get access to more lap sled. Let's finish up here today with our picks to win for Bristol. One guy above $10,000 on FanDuel and one guy below I don't usually pick Brad Keselowski because, again, my model is lower on him. I don't like the fact he doesn't dominate, so I don't tend to pick him. I am going to pick him here, though, uh, just because I feel like when my model is high on someone, it's not usually high on. I feel like that's extra noteworthy. So Keselowski, my pick to win above 10,000, but, again, broadly high in all Penske cars, which brings us to the guy below $10,000, which is Matt Benedetto. He'll be my pick to win down there. Starting up front, awesome in Bristol last year. Good driver, better equipment now than he's had in his entire life. So Brad Keselowski and Matt Benedetto, my two picks to win for Bristol this weekend. But just in general, buy all the Penske stock you possibly can before this race. That is all the time that we have for today. I am excited to see how things play out on Sunday. It should be a really fun race and should be good for DFS too. Once again, make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, you name it, you can find us. And if you like what you hear or if you win some money playing DFS, make sure you leave us a rating and review as well. If you have any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Check out our UFC podcast for this week if you're listening on Sunday or, or Friday or Saturday. And then make sure you check out next week's as well, leading into UFC 250. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, front of the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Hopefully DFS went well for you last night, and hopefully it can go well for you once again on Sunday. Just looking forward to watching more racing at Bristol. This has been the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire.